Thank you all for joining for our latest edition of the Boundaries series. I'm thrilled to be joined by Perth Toll, who's the founder of Life and Liberty Indexes and a true ESG pioneer for thinking that perhaps the dictatorial government or the human rights situation that companies find themselves in should play in to their ESG scores, but we'll dive deeper into that as we talk. I'm Isaac Stonefish, the CEO and founder of the firm Strategy Risks, and thrilled to have a conversation tonight about the Russian invasion of Ukraine and what that means for China. The Russian invasion was very shocking to many people, both in the political community, but also in the investment community, who thought, oh, okay, now in this world of activism that we're in, Russia's invasion of Ukraine means that we need to drastically reduce and sometimes remove our exposures to various Russian markets. And it's raised a lot of questions about investments in China and the question of China exposure and ESG, for those who don't know, environmental, corporate, social governance, how those rankings interact with investments in China. So the topic we're talking about tonight is, could China be next uh, with an invasion of Taiwan, with growing awareness of Chinese human rights abuses, with a number, another global phenomena? So Perth, let's start by talking about this in, in, in really big picture ways. What is the relationship between the Russian invasion of Ukraine and investment in either Chinese markets or global markets that have exposure to Chinese markets? Yeah, thanks, Isaac, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here with you guys. Um, so the, the big picture, you know, investment wise, um, let's just start with how we have been approaching China uh, on Wall Street up to now, which is we're focused on the economic, we were focused on the economic opportunity or the narrative of the economic opportunity, just because there's, you know, so many people in China, um, rising middle class, all of these types of um, types of narratives that Wall Street has been um, kind of telling investors for many years now. Um before, right before this happened, I think investors were starting to notice just the, the huge exposure to China specifically, especially in broad emerging markets funds. So when things like Luckin happened, when things like the crackdown on tech last year, the people that were most affected were not necessarily only the China funds, but also broad emerging markets. And, and people started to take notice at the, the second half of last year. Um, and then when Ukraine happened, I think that that really changed the perspective. So people had been taking notice of China's kind of decline, um, stock market returns wise, as well as the expected decline in the economy. But, you know, China has had a very dramatic and very real rise over the past several decades um, in their economy. And that was due to an increase in economic policies that were more open. Um, during that time. And that was an incredible, incredible time of growth in the past 30 or 40 years. But if you look at something like the MCHI, which is the MSCI China index that includes both onshore and offshore shares, um, towards the end of last year, the cumulative, you know, annual, the annual return uh, was an average of about 3%, which is very abysmal uh, since 1992, the inception of the index. So during a time of extreme growth, you got less than treasury-like returns. And this year, that number approached zero. So I think right now it's sitting around 2%. So, so that's, you know, since 1992, if during a time of tremendous growth, China's stock market returned lower than treasuries, um, investors are starting to say, well, what's going on here? And is it really worth investing in a market like this? Um, especially if that's all we got in a time of tremendous growth. I mean, good luck going forward, right? So that's the background we're coming into it with. And then Russia invaded Ukraine. So when that happened, investors started to notice that, hey, the, um, the, the, the risk lies with the autocracy. And 
Russia was the market that got hit and the instant worldwide sanctions, the coordinated um, way that the West responded to this invasion, I think surprised everyone. And not only China investors, but just emerging markets or stock market investors in general took notice and said, okay, this is, this is a, some, a risk that we didn't calculate before. And who's next? It, it would have to be China because they saw the parallel between China, Taiwan, and Russia, Ukraine. So I think that is the risk that investors are now trying to price in. Um, now, that is still, I would say, a minority of, of investors. I think the majority of Wall Street is still, you know, very much, especially the biggest firms like iShares, BlackRock, uh, they're, they're, they're trying to do business in China. So they're still very hesitant to change the narrative. That's fascinating. So one of my favorite things about doing conversations with the Carnegie Council is we don't have to put ethics to the side and we can ask about these issues from strategic, financial, and also ethical perspectives. So a, a two-part question. You'd mentioned the problem being with autocracies. The first is from a returns perspective, what is the problem with autocracies? And then second, from an ethical perspective, what is the problem with investing in autocracies? And what do you say to folks who say, well, economic growth brings liberalization to these autocracies? Yeah, so so first the question there was the, the kind of the investment case for not investing in aut autocracies. So, I mean, I think the, the biggest investment case is that freer markets have much better foundations for growth. So they are, you know, they have the, the you know, foundation set to support growth because they have transparency, they have more flexibility in their market, they have feedback loops um, as you know, on the market level instead of central planning. So they have incentives for growth and innovation versus incentives to put state interests first. So that's a much better um, setup for growth. And so I think that the biggest thing is there, you know, freer markets perform better. And that's the premise of our, you know, company and, and how we invest. Um, but as far as investing in autocracies, there are some risks that I think investors are starting to take notice of. So there's three main risks, there's political risk, regulatory risk, and autocracy risk. That's the way I categorize it. And those are three different things that are all related, um, that are heightened in autocratic markets. So first one being political risk, um, Companies in autocratic regimes have to prioritize state interests above the interests of all other stakeholders, including their customers and equity shareholders. So investing in these companies lowers the cost of capital for them to operate this way. So we're essentially, as investors, subsidizing their cost of putting state interests first. Uh, now, in some autocratic markets, we're talking about China here, the line between military and civil activity also is diminished. And so often through these funds, passive investors are inadvertently funding military activities that may be against their own interests and the interests of free people everywhere. So these types of investments carry also sanction risk. Right now we're seeing the US possibly about to sanction um, some of these investments here in the States of these Chinese companies, the military related companies. So second risk that is heightened in these types of markets is regulatory risk. We can see, we've seen already some very volatile and very unpredictable government actions that can wipe out shareholder value overnight. So example of this last year, we saw the education companies in China, online education companies like EDU, T-A-L. These companies were very profitable companies that were growing fast. I mean, the joke in China is, hey, if we can't get a job after graduation, we'll just work for New Oriental because they pay so well. These companies were doing very well. And overnight, Friday night, government decides, okay, you guys are now nonprofits. You're not allowed to make a profit anymore because we are wanting to decrease the cost of raising children because now we want people to have more children because of decades of the one child policy has de decimated our demographics. Um, so, you know, that overnight, these very profitable companies, their value was completely wiped out. And we've seen the Wall Street Journal report that, you know, the founder of New Oriental basically broke down in his shareholder meeting the following week. And so, um, 
that's a very sad situation, but also a very real um, risk in these types of markets. We saw recently in the Russia market that shareholder value is completely wiped out across the board. Um, that's a little different situation where it's, you know, they literally became untradeable due to the worldwide sanctions. Um, but again, same, th same result. Um, so shareholder value destruction due to policy interference or due to sanctions is a very real risk in these types of very autocratic markets. And the last one is data risk. So companies that are in these regimes use accounting practices that don't meet international accounting standards. They don't have transparency. And we usually don't know about problems until they're too late. So one example is Evergrande. You know, their debts were showing up on the wrong side of the balance sheet, the way that they do their, their uh, accounting. So nobody knew there was a problem until it became way too big to fix. Um, there's also not independent verification on data because there's no freedom of speech, freedom of media or uh, any kind of freedom of expression. So nobody can question data that comes out of companies or out of governments. So without that foundation of freedom in place, we really can't use data from these countries as if they are something that you know is useful for, the, for measuring the impact of investments. So especially ESG investors should be aware of this, that ESG data from these countries is not reliable either as a, a way to measure impact. Interesting. So those are the three risks. Now that's the you know, investment kind of risks and the investment case for freer versus unfree markets. Um, as far as the you know, moral perspective, we do, you know, we do see investors that invest this way for you know, just to align their values with their investments. And, um, and I think that's, that's, a, that's a very good thing. Like as investors, we are in a position to direct assets and that is a, a position of power and privilege. And, you know, we can affect outcomes. So if you're concerned, first of all, you know, we hear a lot about concerns about China, right? So if you're concerned that China is going to invade Taiwan, but you have the power to affect those outcomes, you know, you, we should use our, those powers for good. Um, but also, if you're concerned that China is going to invade Taiwan for investment purposes, I would be a lot more concerned in emerging markets funds that have, you know, 30 to 40 percent China at any given point mm -hmm. than one that has Taiwan. So um, one is being aware of the, the risk lying with the autocracy and two is using your powers to affect outcomes for good. So tell me more about life and liberty indexes. Do you consider yourself an ESG company? And in what ways do you feel like the ESG space understands or misunderstands investing in autocracies like China and Russia? Yeah, so Life and Liberty Indexes is the, the creator of the FRDM Index, which is the, the world's first freedom-weighted emerging markets index. And the, the reason why we made this is because the standard way of um, investing in indexes, including emerging markets, is market capitalization weighting. So the, the, the biggest markets get the biggest weight. And as a result, China and other autocracies has you know, 40% plus weight in most broad emerging markets indexes. Um, we started with emerging markets because in emerging markets, there are so many autocracies in the universe. And um, so it's, it's a more, it's a more uh, kind of a, a way to kind of capture alpha in the freer markets instead of um, being these autocracy heavy investments. Um, so, so, you know, we, that's, that's why we do what we do. I forgot the second half of your question. If you could repeat that. <laughs> <laughs> so on the ESG space itself, oh, yeah. how do you feel like they, how well do you think they understand or misunderstand China and Russia? Yeah. So um, I think most of our investors understand it pretty well, but I think that's a new thing that all investors are starting to now pay attention to these types of risks in autocracies. You know, Russia invading Ukraine had a lot to do with that and just us seeing this unprecedented um, coordinated move on, on the, the freer markets part to limit the way that investors end up funding terrorism and funding you know, a war. Um, that I think really opened people's eyes. And um, also it opened people's eyes to how ESG has failed up to this point and how the way we look at ESG as an industry is really insufficient for these types of risks. We've completely ignored as the ESG industry, country level political risk. 
Um, and, you know, ESG right now, uh, the way that Wall Street does it is company level only. We only look at company level metrics. And this works great if all you care about is S&P 500 or developed markets. But when you go into emerging markets, you know, as we've already mentioned, those metrics are meaningless if you don't have the basic freedoms in place that, that give those metrics independent verification. And so, um, so just looking at company level metrics, especially in the emerging markets, has been extremely uh, not effective as far as an ESG strategy. So we don't actually, we don't call ourselves ESG, but the metrics we look at are personal and economic freedoms, things like terrorism, trafficking, torture, women's freedoms, freedom of speech, media expression, assembly, you know, religion, internet, um, civil procedure, criminal procedure, plurality of political parties, you know, legitimate elections, and then economic freedoms like taxation, rule of law, private property rights, business regulations, freedom to trade internationally, and so forth, sound monetary policy. Um, so all of these things are very much in the spirit of ESG. So, so yeah, a lot of ESG investors use our product. We don't use company level ESG metrics, but what we found is that if you have the G on the com country level, I'm sorry, we don't use company level ESG metrics, but what we found that is if you have the G on the country level in place, the security level typically takes care of itself as far as ESG. And in fact, without doing any security level ESG, we do just 100% freedom weighting on the country level. Um, without security level ESG metrics, we have an A rating from MSCI on ESG for our fund. So um, I think the most important thing in emerging markets is based on our research, that country level governance score and everything else builds on that. Awesome, awesome. Now, when you're mentioning ESG, I, I kept thinking about the Chinese company Hikvision, which mm. have a pretty high ESG score across several platforms, even though <laughs> surveillance cameras for concentration camps and yeah. it's coming out that you know, it'll, it'll likely have more severe U.S. government restrictions. So at least yeah. it seems like things in that case are moving in the right direction. So yeah, that's really ridiculous because uh, Hike Vision was a, you know, holding in most emerging markets ESG funds up until recently, um, which, you know, obviously they're, we're now funding surveillance in, like you said, in concentration camps and so in ESG funds. So no gambling, tobacco, you know, alcohol, porn, but genocide is perfectly fine. And that, that's, that's just a failure of, uh, you know, traditional ESG. <laughs> so. and, and what role does China play in that failure? And not in the sense of the heavy hand of Chinese officials meddling in the data, but Western perceptions, perceptions of firms like BlackRock or Blackstone or Goldman that don't want to upset their chances of investing in China. Do you feel like part of the reason it's taken us so long to wake up to these realities is because of that? Or do you feel like that's a separate issue? No, I think Wall Street definitely led that conversation. Um, you know, these are the biggest asset managers in the world. Um, and they set, they, they set the, the stories, they set the stage. And also they're tracking in indexes, benchmark indexes by MSCI, by FTSE, who, you know, it's kind of like a, the, the triangle of death, right? So you have the asset managers, the Black Rocks of the world, you have the index providers, the MSCIs of the world, and then you have the largest institutional investors, right? They're the, you know, they, the pension funds, the, you know, endowments, the sovereign wealth funds, right? The, the large investors of the world who have to benchmark to indexes. So they have to, you know, follow whatever MSCI is doing. So MSCI setting the benchmarks is going to tell you, well, we don't tell people how to invest. We're just an indexer. And then iShares, the asset manager is going to tell you, oh, well, we, we don't tell people how to invest. We just follow the index. And then the, the asset, you know, the, the investors, the big investors are going to tell you, well, we, you know, we, we can't deviate from the benchmark because that's career risk. So we have to follow that. And so these three, it's like an endless cycle of death. Everybody has to follow each other and nobody takes responsibility. So, you know, MSCI's president, her, um, Henry Fernandez has gone on TV and said, we, we don't tell people how to invest. We're, you know, we're just, you know, market cap waiting. And then iShares president, um, I'm sure everybody knows Larry Fink is a huge um, fan of China in the media. And he's also, um, 
made himself the 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 purveyor of all things ESG. So he's now the the judge of ESG, the standard bearer of ESG in the United States. And so he's he's has uh, kind of put himself out as such. Uh, yet at the same time, last year, as China was drawing down, um, you know, uh, crashing in, in, in the second half, the BlackRock Institute came out and said, you guys should all increase your, you should all triple your China exposure. Everybody should triple their China exposure. If they had done that, followed that advice, you know, they're crashing even more this year. So, um, so I think, yeah, Wall Street is going to perpetuate this, this narrative, but that's okay because you know what, there's, you know, we need everybody on different sides of the trade. So as, as long as they continue to do that, there will continue to be alpha found in the freer markets. So let's get back to Russia. Can you remember when you first thought of the China link between the Russian invasion, you know, when you first asked yourself the question, oh gosh, when will this happen to China? Yeah, I think as soon as Russia invaded, um, a lot of us in our minds, the, just the previous week was the Olympics and, you know, Putin was in Beijing with Xi and they had came out and said, you know, we will stand behind Russia 100%. You know, there are no limits to our relationship. So I think um, when they said that the week before, everybody was thinking, well, why are they saying that um, right now? Right. Is, is it because they're about to invade Taiwan and they want Russia's support? Um, or is it because they, they know Russia wants to invade Ukraine and they don't want Russia to do that during the Olympics? They want them to wait till after. And in fact, Putin waited till after the Olympics um, to invade Ukraine. And so maybe that was the correct, you know, uh, reason, maybe that was the actual reason why they said that. But um, even now, China has not truly, you know, backed down on their rhetoric supporting Russia. They are blaming the U.S. for the invasion, saying it's because, you know, we forced Russia's hand by strengthening NATO or whatever it is. Um, just like they blamed the U.S. for coronavirus and they, they blamed the U.S. in 2000. 15 and 16 for their own stock market crash. They actually blamed MSCI as one of their many scapegoats for, you know, MSCI didn't add A shares to their indexes. So now we're crashing, you know, so, so yeah, they're going to, they're going to blame other people. And I think um, the way that they have uh, intensified this rhetoric is causing uh, a lot of investors to realize that there is some, not only secondary sanction risk there, but there's, you know, heightened, Auto, you know, autocracy risk that we should be aware of in China as well as Russia. The time to divest from Russia was not after they had been written off from all the indexes. The time to divest was before that happened, you know, um, and the time to divest from China is not to wait till after they invade either. So <laughs> for, for those who don't know, can you walk people through what secondary sanctions are? I'm actually not a policy expert, but that would be like if, if China, you know, my understanding is that if China were to help Russia evade sanctions put on them by the rest of the world, then China could be subject to secondary sanctions. So one thing I like to do in conversations like these is ask impossible questions about predicting the future, uh, which <laughs> Great. unless you're a clairvoyant that you didn't put the bio, you can't do. But um, if China does invade Taiwan, let's say two different cases, there's a limited invasion or there's a major invasion, what impact do you think that'll have on not uh, com Chinese companies, but on U.S. companies with high China exposure, companies like Apple and Tesla? Yeah, I think companies like Apple have, Apple's suppliers have started to diversify their supply chains already. You know, they're building plants in the U.S., Japan, India, other places. Um, so so that's something that's already that I think they're already preparing for. Yeah, it will it will affect them. Um, but the more they, the better they prepare for it, the less it will affect them. Um, Tesla is I don't know. Tesla seems pretty stuck. Um, <laughs> so. That, that seems bad. I, I think that would be uh, very bad for Tesla. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I think that com American companies are very much intertwined with trade with China. Uh, we did expect better outcomes from that trade. And, you know, in general, as, as freedom investors, we believe that trade is good in general. 
Um, we just don't want to invest in companies that are subject to the Chinese government as far as, you know, if they can stroke of a pen, say you have to become nonprofits now or something like that. Um, but we are invested in a lot of companies that do trade with China, um, you know, in Taiwan or Chile and South Korea. So, you know, those companies can be affected by, you know, what happens in China. And there is some, there is some, you know, cross pollination there. Uh, they can choose to diversify their supply chains now. Um, and a lot of them are actually doing that. And so um, it's, it's a cost benefit analysis on their part. They're going to do what's in the best interest of their, their, their shareholders and themselves. Uh, and that's what we want. Um, so, so hopefully these companies will take action. And I think in the freer markets, they do have more flexibility to do so. Um, but your question as far as if China were to invade Taiwan right now, what would happen with American companies like Tesla? I think it would be a very bad situation for Tesla. Ask Tesla has a lot of issues already. I, I don't know. <laughs> Besides <laughs> that, there's a you know, precarious situation in general, but that would be very bad. Are, are there companies that you feel like have engaged in best practices with Russia since the invasion, either by rectifying past mistakes or putting out statements that you feel like are good templates for corporate behavior or investment behavior with China? So I think, um, so I'm not actually, we, we never invested since the inception of the fund, we never had China or Russia exposure. So I don't mm -hmm. actually keep up with, you know, these types of, and also we're emerging markets only, so we don't invest in U.S. companies either. So, you know, we don't have U.S. exposure, so I don't know, keep up with, you know, the U.S. statements. Um, but I think the companies that acted quickest and, you know, made, you know, a kind of just a, a bold cutoff of, you know, we don't want to be associated with this, even if we're going to lose money. Um, I think that ripping off the Band-Aid at the earliest possible point in a decisive way helped those companies. And it's the ones that wavered, that went back and forth, that I think, um, you know, people are like, you know, what's actually going on here? And so it's the same thing with on the country level, you know, com countries like uh, Estonia, Poland, you know, these companies jumped in fr from from the beginning um, to help and take a stand. And then you got countries like Germany, you know, <laughs> where, so we don't know what's going to happen. So, um, so yeah, I think there's a lot of companies that still are buying into this, um, you know, this, this growth story, which they think they're going to be able to capture and they're ignoring these expropriation and other types of risks. Um, and I think that the more they drag that out in the end, the more it's going to hurt shareholders. So I think it's important to, before something happens, have a plan in place um, if you're a company that works that closely with China. Um, and then if something were to happen, implement the plan without a second thought, because the more it drags out, the more your shareholders are going to wonder what's going on. Are there countries that people are either surprised you consider autocratic or surprised that you consider non-autocratic? You know, are some edge cases that raise eyebrows or people think, oh, I didn't realize that X country was, you know, was as dark as, as you said. Yeah, I think uh, India is, is one of those. And India is borderline uh, in our index. Sometimes it's in, sometimes it's out because our index looks at uh, your relative freedom level to your peers. So as long as you're more free than your peers, you're in. If you're less free than your peers, you're out. And then it's according to the strength of your freedom level that you, your, your allocation is. So the heavier allocations are the freer countries. Um, so India was in the index in 19 and 20, and then they dropped in 21 and did not come back in 22. So what happened was they uh, increased kind of the, the repression of their Kashmir peoples, they had blacked out the internet in places that had protests, like farmers protests, and they uh, increased their kind of um, coercion of the media in that year. And so because of that, you know, we use third party scores, we don't score countries ourselves. So, so we have that third party objectivity, we use the human freedom index scores by Cato and Fraser. Um, and so their score dropped enough that they dropped out of the index. Um, and I think a lot of people are surprised by that. I was surprised by that because they, um, you know, it's the world's largest democracy. And, you know, I think has a lot of potential. They have just as, they have just as many people. I mean, a lot of people, a lot of, you know, young and educated population. 
Um, so I think that India is one of those countries that it surprises people when it's not in there. And sometimes it surprises people when it's in there. So it just depends. But uh, what I found is that the reaction from people in these countries to being excluded or included is uh, is telling and interesting. So, you know, we have a lot of fans in India, actually. Um, you know, they were in our fund for a couple of years. And, um, and then when they dropped, some of them were like, yeah, I'm not surprised. Um, so, uh, and then some of them were like, well, you know, it's, it really shouldn't have been dropped or it should be back in. But um, the reaction was kind of mixed in that sense. Um, Brazil made it into the index recently. Yeah. It was not before. And I've met, I've been in New York in the subways and, and met Brazilian and people who asked about the index and, and they were like, is it in there? And when it wasn't, they were like, yeah, that sounds about right. I mean, so these countries that have the freedom of expression, uh, the freedom to criticize their governments, um, tend to re respond better to um, being excluded when that happens. And, you know, in China, everybody hates us, right? Everybody's like, you're ridiculous. Like this is the stupidest idea ever. Like this needs to be, you know, China is the, you know, world leader in ESG, you know? So, so literally totally night and day difference as far as the reactions that we get from, you know, investors in these countries. So I think that is a telling thing as well. But, um, but yeah, India is one of those countries that really surprised me when it was dropped, but it actually, it, it's very borderline. So it can make it back in at any, any time. So we'll, we'll be taking some questions from the audience. So folks who have thoughts or questions they want to add, please put that in the chat and we'll get to those soon. Perth, you, you mentioned, I think the expression you used was circle of death with Wall Street and China and this negative cycle of encouragement. What about positive encouragement? What do you recommend folks do who want to see, say, their university endowment or their pension fund make more ethical investment decisions? Yeah, I think the, you know, if you, if what we're trying to do here is, there, you know, there's a lot of positive benefits to freedom, right? Freer countries have higher life expectancy, lower infant mortality, higher gender equality, lower poverty rates. And if you look at their poverty rates, the, the poorest people in the freer countries are significantly more wealthy than the poorest people in the in the least free countries. Um, they have lower corruption. They have you know higher income per capita, higher GDP growth. These are these are all the benefits of freedom that I think we should focus more on. Um, but they're very kind of nebulous and they're hard to to measure. So what we try to do with the FRDM index is you know in the emerging markets we try to be a running scorecard for freedom. And if you look at our performance in, since inception three years ago compared to benchmarks like uh, EEM, IEMG, or VWO, like the, the kind of uh, market cap weighted benchmarks, um, it's very stark outperformance. It's, it's crazy. Uh, I think that's because we've had some very extreme events like COVID and the, the Russian-Ukraine war. Um, so this has really shown the benefit of investing in the freer markets. And we're, we're, when Wall Street and everybody else is so focused on China, on Russia, you know, Saudi Arabia, some of these very unfree markets, I think that takes the focus away from where it should be, which is where the freer markets are. And they're missing out on those markets. And, and that's a huge opportunity cost. So I think for people that are wanting to encourage their endowments or their schools or whoever to invest in a way that supports freedom around the world, especially in the emerging markets, um, you should focus on those growth stories that are the growth stories of the future. These are the, the, the freer com countries. They have better, more sustainable growth. It's not debt-driven, state-mandated growth. They have better recoveries. If you like the recovery from the COVID drawdown, the freer markets significantly outperformed the unfree markets in the recovery. Um, and they have uh, better use of human and economic capital. So there's less capital flight and capital destruction. You know, when you have something like the one child policy for 30 years, that's huge capital destruction on a human on a human level. Um, when you have people, you know, governments coming in with a stroke of a pen overnight, making companies nonprofits, that is huge shareholder capital destruction. So there's a lot more capital destruction and capital flight from these types of unfree markets. So the freer markets also because they have better institutions, stronger institutions, uh, better rule of law and, you know, investor and private property rights, 
um, and individual protections, they are the safe havens in the emerging markets, especially. So we should focus more on those markets and less so on the unfree ones to find the growth stories of the future instead of focusing on the growth stories of the past. What role does the conversation about climate change play in decisions to invest or not invest in China and Russia, especially now, especially, I guess, both before and after the invasion? Comments on that, thoughts on that? Yeah, so I've seen as far as, you know, and, and again, we, we don't look at environmental factors, the, those kind of come with the territory, like the freer markets, just they correlate better with better environmental protections. And so um, the freer markets are, are leaders in that aspect as well. Um, but what I've seen before is, is a lot of these autocracies using climate change as a talking point. So China has touted themselves as being the world leaders in uh, environmental protections, the world leaders in, in fighting climate change. Um, that's their rhetoric. And I would say, you know, watch their actions because they are the world's biggest polluters and they still are. Um, they're not making these changes that they're, you know, making pledges to make. And I think that the climate change conversation has provided autocracies with a distraction um, from the issues like human rights and issues like, you know, they're slowing growth in their own markets. And so um, I think we need to be careful there as ESG investors not to let climate change become a way for dictators to hijack the conversation because it's easy to make promises. It's easy to make pledges. And climate change is a, is a very easy target for dictators to do that with. We have a question from the audience about Tesla and the idea of Tesla being stuck in the Chinese market. And I'm wondering, Perth, if you could elaborate on what you meant by that with Tesla. Yeah. So the reason why I said that about Tesla is it seems like if you look at Elon Musk, um, he's very vocal, right? Um, that's why investors you know, who like him love him so much. And he just says whatever he wants to say, but never about China. He has come out and said things about the United States, about Saudi Arabia, um, when he was about to buy Twitter and the Saudi owner said, you know, something like, we don't, we don't want you to, or, you know, and then he said, well, how, how do you feel about free speech in Saudi Arabia or media freedoms? Because he was referring to what happened um, with Khashoggi and um, he's just, just, you know, right back at him, but he will never say anything about China. And in fact, he seems to do whatever China wants him to do. When, you know, when last year, when the, all the news stories came out about Xinjiang and the um, proof of the genocide taking place there, he opened a Tesla showroom in Xinjiang. So that's kind of a big middle finger to the Uyghurs and anyone who cares about the, the Uyghur situation. Um, and the timing of that was very interesting. And so, um, I think, and he's he's openly said good things about China, um, things that sound very much like kind of sound bites, right? That that were, you know, that he may not may or may not actually mean, but has to say. So uh, he's a very smart guy. He's going to do what's what's best for for Tesla, and maybe right now, because he's so ingrained in the China market, maybe the best thing is for him to, you know, be muzzled on that and be speak out about everyone else's. Uh, social issues instead of China's. Um, so I'm just looking at his actions. He seems very stuck based on what he can't say and the, the actions that he's taken, uh, the actions like the Xinjiang showroom. That's fascinating. In a business investment where good information is placed at such a premium, you have so many people speaking very blandly or inaccurately about China, namely just focusing on the positive. And you know, every country in the world has positives and negatives. There's obviously very clear negatives with the party that so rarely come out from folks like Musk. And I think that's one of the things that perverts our understanding of Chinese markets and, and Chinese investments. So, yeah, I mean, with Musk, I'll just add one more thing. I think we should hold him accountable. Um, here in the States, especially if he's, if the Twitter deal goes through, um, you know, he, the Chinese state media has already tweeted out so much of, they retweet everything he says. Um, and, you know, when, when the news came out that he was going to buy Twitter, 
they actually came out and said, hey, we love Tesla, you know, in China, you know, Tesla is doing great here. And it was kind of like this, you know, nice car business you have here. It would be a shame if something happened to it, right? Um, my friend uh, Times Wang actually tweeted that if you guys want to follow Times on, on Twitter. But, um, you know, so so the, this is this is something that um, everyone, I think, is watching very closely. I hope we will hold him accountable and see, hey, are you, you know, these the Chinese state media is asking you to remove their state media affiliated labels. Is he actually going to do that? I think that would be very telling if, if that happens, you know, so we should, you know, as, as uh, us investors, as Twitter users, um, we should hold him accountable to those things as well. A lot of young folks would love to get into the investment space, but are worried about these human rights and ethical concerns. What advice would you give someone just coming out of college or just coming out of business school who wants to work in the investment field, but cares passionately about these issues? I say, please come work um, in, in the field because we need you. Um, this field is rife with people who are just here to make money people who don't care about human rights. Um, and I think that, you know, the problems that stem from that are, are obvious now. Um, and the tide is turning and the, the young people coming in have potential to change the world and, and they have so much power. And I, I hope they realize their power and their, um, and they, they use it for good because, because we need people like that in the industry. Is there a question from the audience that takes on some of those points about comments that uh, Chamath, who's an early investor mm. in Facebook, and Ray Dalio have made uh, both about China, but also about the idea that uh, people don't really care about human rights in the investment and VC world. Yeah. Do you feel like an accurate reflection and, or do you feel like there's a way to counter or push back on that and a real movement to do so? Yeah, so Chamath and Dalio are different in the sense that Chamath is, he just doesn't care and he doesn't care that anybody knows that he doesn't care. And so he, you know, he's come out and said this. And so, uh, you know, it's below his line, right? I don't care. Like, you know, it's below what I care about. So that's, you know, he's telling you who he is. He's telling you what he cares and doesn't care about. So if you're an investor, you know, you choose accordingly. Do you want to invest with someone like that or not? If, if not, there's a lot of other people you could invest with. I think that's a little different from Ray Dalio, who has business in China, who, you, you know, we there's I don't know how much China has invested in um, Bridgewater uh, funds, but it seems like sig pretty substantial or enough that it would make him um, probably one of the most famous China apologists on Wall Street today. Um, so I think, you know, these these types of things just show us, you know, who these investors are and what they stand for. Um, and that's an important thing for investors to know. So once we know that, invest accordingly it's it's up to it's their right you know to to say these things is there is their right to, to care or not care and it's our right to invest with them or not glad you made that point about freedom of speech and free choice and it, it does feel like with more information about what is actually going on in a lot of these places you know, people will make more ethical choices so where do you like to gather information about the situation, say, in China or in Russia, you know, what kind of news services or databases do you feel like have the right inputs to look at for these issues? Yeah. So one more thing on that question, I, I noticed that he also said, do you think there's a movement within these communities to counter that vision? I, I failed to address that. Um, I think there is. So um, and I think there there's a lot more. Uh, some of them do it anonymously, but I think there for every um, action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. And I think that that's fair to say in the hedge fund and investment world as well. So, and I would say that right now, um, you know, I've, I've been in this since before the war, since before China imploded. And I can tell you that I have felt the difference. Um, you know, our fund um, basically doubled um, in, the, in March because, because of the Russian invasion and because people started to realize uh, these issues. And once people realize these issues, there's no going back. So I think there's absolutely a movement to counter the, the traditional position of Wall Street and hedge funds. Um, so, so going back to your question, um, Isaac, uh, repeat that question again. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> 
Last question. I, I, I was hoping you didn't ask me to do that because after I, I asked the question, let me see if I can uh, <laughs> come back. Sorry, into... I totally oh, went I back to the previous question. The sources of information that oh, yeah. you really like to use on these issues. So I, you know, rumor has it that you're developing a source that I'm going to love. Um, so I'm looking forward to that, the completion of that project. And I hope you will keep me posted on that. Um, I also like China Beige Book. Um, I like um, some, you know, there's, there's some very good um, Twitter accounts, uh, like, I don't even remember them now, but CN Wire has a lot of good investment related um, headline, like, you know, news issues. They'll, they'll usually come out with the breaking news. It's kind of like a constant news feed. So CN, I think, underscore wire. Um, in the hedge fund world, obviously, you know, Kyle Bass is very, um, very vocal. Um, there's, there's lots of good Twitter accounts, actually, and I, I can't think of them all right now. Um, Trinomics is good. Um, she's in Hong Kong. Um, I, I really, there's, there's, there's so many, maybe we can like, maybe I'll tweet out like a list at some point, but there's just too many for me to remember right now. A lot of the, actually a lot of CNN and Bloomberg, surprisingly. Um, I know these guys have a reputation for, for kind of having a bias, but I follow a lot of journalists, um, on Bloomberg and CNN that have been very, um, uh, vocal on, on, or becoming more vocal on reporting things coming out of China that are maybe not popular with the Chinese government. Uh, now, not, not, you know, in Hong Kong or China. So like not journalists that are in those countries right now, they have to be a little more careful and you do kind of see that self-censorship going on. Um, but the ones that are, that are in Taiwan, based in Taiwan or based in other countries. So I think, we were able to hear some great thoughts from Perth, who's experiencing some technical difficulties. So I think this is a, a good point to end. I'm glad we got to address a lot of these fascinating issues. Grateful for the Carnegie Council, as always, for hosting this conversation and hope to see and chat with everyone soon. Thank you.